The text this morning is from Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 7. These are the words of God. But what things were gained to me, those I, com- those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, uh, all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through, faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your goodness to us in giving us this word. I pray that this gospel would be plain and obvious to us. I pray your spirit would make it so. And I pray that we'd all go from this place knowing exactly what you would have us do. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, his strong name. Amen. Amen. So as we continue through the book of Philippians, we come now to a, a particular passage that has a particular gospel turn in it that is extremely troublesome to the carnal mind. This is a difficult passage for an unregenerate mind to grasp. The square peg of an alien righteousness does not go into the round hole of any righteousness of my own. Consequently, a great deal of ingenuity has been expended in trying to make the language of Scripture fit in with how the carnal mind likes to work. And this is particularly the case with the carnal religious mind. We might even go so far as to say that this problem, this tension, is the driving engine of almost all new developments in theology. And that is not a good thing. The great Charles Hodge once said, if it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it's not true. The challenge always comes down to the unvarnished gospel versus the cold clatter of morality. That's what it always comes down to. Men trying to be righteous on their own and men receiving the righteousness of Christ. Those are the only two genuine options in this world. But this this takes some getting used to. We need to explain it. We need to work through it. And we need to be confronted with this reality regularly. In his previous life, prior to his conversion, Paul had been very proud of his resume, which we went over earlier. He was proud of his heritage. All of those things had been gained to him, but no more. All of those things were gained, but no longer. He uses here the same word for gain that he had used earlier in Philippians 1.21. Uh, The word is kerdos. Earlier he had said to live as Christ, to die as gain. There, the, the, the metric for evaluating things was right side up. Here, he's confessing that it was upside down. All these things that previously had been gained to me, I now count but loss. So this indicates a complete reversal of values. This is a complete reversal of values. Paul went from the time when all that that resume was gained to him, and now he is living in a state where to live is Christ and to die is more Christ, to die is gain. So he counts all of that, as a loss for the sake of Christ, verse 7. All of that is a wash. All of that is gone for the sake of Christ. He goes on to extend his surrender to everything, all things, considering the loss of everything to be insignificant when compared to the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. That's verse 8. So it's not just what's on his resume, it's everything else that's outside his resume. Every conceivable honor, every conceivable achievement, every conceivable attribute of virtue, he considers it all loss. More than insignificant, he counts every possible honor as scubalon, rubbish, garbage, awful, dung, muck, dregs, scrapings, or refuse. Verse 8. In other words, he, he is heaping contempt on all of his virtue, on all of his pride, on all of his glory that he had previously, and he had a significant amount of glory earlier. He is heaping contempt on it. 
He rejects his own righteousness. That righteousness, which is, quote-unquote, by law, he rejects his own righteousness, and he wants to be found in Christ by faith, not having his own righteousness, but rather the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's verse 9. Now, here, verse 9, is the heart of what I want to be talking about, and I'm going to be returning to this point and emphasizing this point because this is the twisty part. This is the slippery part for us to get a hold of. He not only wants Christ now and Christ at the last, but he also wants Christ on the journey. That's verse 10. He wants Christ now, he wants Christ at the last day, and he wants Christ in between now and the last day. Experiencing the power of resurrection now means a promise of attaining to the resurrection of the dead at the last day. In other words, when Paul is going through afflictions today, when, when he's going through afflictions now, and he's able to triumph over those afflictions by faith, that is an indication, that's a guarantee, that's a, a seal that he is going to indeed be raised at the last day. So resurrection power now is faith in your tribulation, and that is an indicator that you're going to attain to the resurrection of the dead at the last day. Verse 11. Not that he's already made it, or not that he's already attained to it, because he knows that he has not, but he pursues it nevertheless. He wants nothing more than to apprehend that for which he was apprehended. He wants to seize upon that for which he was seized. Verse 12. So on the Damascus road, God seized him. And Paul wants to pursue and seize that for which he was seized. He wants to apprehend that for which he was apprehended. So, here's the challenging part. We have to screw this all the way in. This is an area where we have to pay close attention to the exhortation given by that great Puritan Richard Baxter when he exhorted preachers to, quote, screw the truth into men's minds. This truth, and this truth particularly, has to be screwed into men's minds. If we don't take care to do that, this is a particular truth. This particular truth will always pop out again, rattle on the floor for a moment, and disappear into an obscure corner, and you're going to have trouble finding it. This is a difficult concept for us to grasp. It is particularly difficult for religious, middle-class, respectable types. It's particularly difficult for people who clean up real nice. This is a truth that is hard to hang on to. This is hard to hang on to, and we have to make sure that we hang on to it because this is the hinge upon which everything turns. So, let's talk about what Paul's talking about in verse 9 and look at another place where he talks about the same thing. We're talking about submitting to the righteousness of God. There's another place in Paul where he summarizes this glorious truth, talking about how the exquisitely pious Jews, in all of their zeal, had managed to miss it. They, many of them, had memorized the Old Testament. They knew what the middle letter of the Old Testament was. And this is because they were so scrupulous in copying out manuscripts by hand. This was before the invention of printing. They had to know what the middle letter was to make sure that they hadn't missed something. They were focused on every detail. They knew every rivet. They knew every stitch. They knew the Bible. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness to me. These are people who had the Old Testament memorized. They, they knew everything about it except what it was about. They knew everything about it except the Christ to, who, to whom it pointed. So these are the Jews, and all their zeal, they managed to miss it. Well, what went wrong? How was it possible for people that dedicated, that focused, uh, hardworking as they were, how was it possible for them to miss it? Well, Romans 10.3 tells us this, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, notice that's the opposite of what Paul says here in Philippians, not having a righteousness of my own. These people are going about to establish a righteousness of their own. And here it is, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What does that mean? Well, the word, not, not surprisingly, the word for submit here means submit. But we have to, I want to give you some contextual pointers so we have, so we know exactly what we mean. This means submit, submit. 
The word for submit here is hupatasso. Hupatasso. And it's the same word that is used in a number of other places or settings. Domestic servants, house slaves, are told to be subject to their masters. 1 Peter 2.18. Hupatasso. Be subject to your masters. Slaves, slave, master. Wives are commanded to be submissive to their own husbands. Colossians 3.18. We are all called to be subject to principalities and powers. That's Titus 3.1. Hupatasso again. The young should submit to the elderly. That's 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Hupotasso once more. And so the problem is that the problem that the Jews had was found in their unwillingness to submit to the righteousness of God. What slaves do to their masters, what wives to husbands, what young people to elders, um, citizens to rulers, the Jews were unwilling to do that to the righteousness of God. This is why the gospel is described by Paul later on in chapter 10 of Romans, why it's described by Paul as a message to be obeyed. That's Romans 10, 16. The, Bible, the, the gospel is described as a message to be obeyed, not just heard, not just nodded along with. We don't just say, yes, uh-huh, I've heard it before. But the gospel has something in it that has to be obeyed. And the thing that has to be obeyed is righteousness. The thing that has to be obeyed is the righteousness of someone else. Okay, that's why the message has to be obeyed. And this is why those who reject it are described as disobedient people. The gospel comes and they disobey. All right, so in our text, in Philippians 3, Paul says that he wanted to be, he had, he wanted to be found in Christ not having his own righteousness. He didn't want his own righteousness. In Romans 10, the Jews were going about to establish their own righteousness. So they're trying to establish their own righteousness, and they refuse to submit to the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3. Now this means that what we're talking about is not acknowledging that God over there is righteous. We're not asking if someone, if one of these Jews taking a, a test, a theology test on the attributes of God... Uh, and it came to, is God righteous? He would have said, no, that's not true. No, he would say that's true. He would acknowledge the truth that God is righteous. The Almighty is righteous. Over there, he's righteous. That's not the issue. That's not, that's not the righteousness that they're refusing to submit to. An acknowledgement that God in his own person is righteousness, is, is righteous, is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, uh, we're not, we're not, um, we are not acknowledging that God is righteous, but rather we are trusting in. It's not acknowledging that, it's trusting in. The righteousness of someone else is imputed to us, and so it is that every form of ego credit vanishes. And this is the only way to get ego credit to vanish. It's the only way it's done. So the righteousness of somebody else, Christ's perfect sinless life, his death on the cross, his burial in the grave, his resurrection from the dead, all of that, all of that righteousness lived out in a human being's perfect existence is imputed to you. And when you receive it by faith, what you're doing is you're submitting to that righteousness. You're submitting to it. You're obeying it. You're coming under it. The poison of autonomy is here. The poison of autonomy is therefore found in the personal possessive pronouns, words like mine or ours, and so forth. It is not to be found in the external things that we cook up to do, which may or may not be noble or right. Some men trying to save themselves might come up with wicked things. Other men trying to save themselves might come up with good things, good things in, in themselves. So some men want to please God by flying airplanes into skyscrapers. They, that, that's an evil thing, but they think that God approves of it. They think God applauds it. So they fly a plane into a skyscraper. That's a wicked thing, but they think it's righteous, and they think God thinks it's righteous. Or someone might say, I'm going to establish soup kitchens. I'm going to, I'm going to help little old ladies across the street. I'm going to uh, start a philanthropic organization that's going to help the poor. That, those things, objectively, in themselves, are good. Those are good things. So men might try to do wicked things that they think are good, that they think are righteous, in order to commend themselves to God. Or they might do things that actually are good to try to commend themselves to God. But notice that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, if I 
give, if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, but have not love, he says, I am nothing. If I give everything away, if everything I own is given away to feed the poor, but I don't have love, I am nothing. Well, why is that? That's because I didn't give everything away. I gave everything away except my own righteousness. I gave everything away except my sense of self-worth, my sense of dignity, my sense that I'm a good person. I gave everything away but me. <laughs> right? Everything away. In fact, I was trying to build up a storehouse of more me. I was trying to increase my store of self-righteousness. I Look at me. I gave all this money away. Look at me. People have given me this, this honor, this award, this, this dignity. And so look, look at me go. Look at me go. Look at me go. So I gave everything away except my own righteousness. So as long as I cling to that, I'm clutching at my own essential unrighteousness. I'm clutching at my own unrighteousness. And this is why, this, and this is the hard part, this is the thing that we have to screw into our minds, this is why the deepest repentance possible is not of the things we are ashamed of. That's, that, that repentance for that sort of thing is good. It's right. John the Baptist preaches a message of repentance and is conducting a baptism of repentance and all the tax collectors and, and prostitutes in Judea go down and receive it. They're repenting of their vices. And it was good that they repented of their vices. But that's not the deepest repentance possible. There's a deeper repentance, and it's a much deeper repentance. Men are not truly converted until the day that their virtues humiliate them. You're not truly converted until your virtues seem like dross in your eyes. Men are not truly converted until the day that their virtues humiliate this, humiliate them. This is why tax collectors and whores enter the kingdom first, as Jesus says in Matthew 21, 31. And sometimes we put three or four layers of holy speak varnish on top of the words of Jesus. And we do, and, me, and that's an innate, it's Bible talk, right? And we, we thereby ignore what he actually said. Jesus said, round up all the theologians and scribes in Israel. And he said, the hookers are getting into heaven before they are. Why? Because the theologians all graduated from Bag of Snakes Seminary. And I'm going to go up to their temple and I'm going to flip tables. Jesus was not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Jesus was confronting, and this is the key, Jesus was confronting the virtues of Israel. He was confront, confronting, now there was a great deal of wickedness behind, scene, behind the scenes and under the table. There's a lot of wickedness going on. But Jesus was challenging their virtues. The hookers and the tax collectors know how valuable all of their virtues are, which is to say not very which cannot be said for the theologians and the scribes. See, this is the problem. When we, when we come to repent of our vices, well, let's say your, your vices bother you, they bug you. When you come to repent of your vices, you're, re you're repenting of porn. You know, you're, what, you're, what are you trying to do when you're, when you're either repenting or you're seeking to repent or wishing you could figure out a way to repent? What are you doing when you're trying to repent of your porn or your anger problem? What you're trying to do is you're trying to flip your life right side up. That's what you're trying to do. And you, and you think, well, obvi it's obvious that I ought to be trying to flip my life right side up. But when, you, when someone tells you to repent of your virtues, he's telling you to flip your life upside down. And what kind of sense does that make? I've already got enough things upside down. <laughs> things are already raggedy over here. Why would, I, why, why would I find my three remaining virtues and try to invert them? Because that's the thing that's in the way. That's the thing. That's, you're not submitting to the righteousness of another. You're not submitting to the righteousness of God. Flannery O'Connor describes, and she describes this principle wonderfully, at the conclusion of her very potent short story, a short story called Revelation. At the climax of the story, a woman, a white, respectable woman down south, has been given a vision, and she has been given this vision most reluctantly, you know, <laughs> she receives it most reluctantly, and the story is the whole setup on how she is brought to the point where she can see this. Mrs. Turpin has been given a vision of a great procession into heaven, and at the conclusion of the story, it says this, Upon it, a vast horde of souls were tumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives. 
and bands of blacks in white robes, and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people whom she recognized at once as those who, like herself and Claude, Claude being her husband, who, like herself and Claude, had always had a little of everything and the given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they always had been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces, even their virtues were being burned away. And that's what it means to come under the righteousness of Christ. Even your virtues are burned away. You see, it's really difficult. It's really challenging for us because uh, gunk, uh, sexual gunk, emotional gunk, all the gunk that we get into that we know is gunk. It's like pine pitch on your hands. And, and you, how do I get this off? But it comes off. You can, you can be washed clean. But the grime of your virtues goes clean to the bone. And what is it? What can, what can scrub that off? What can scrub off your virtue? What can scrub off your own sense of your own dignity and your own rightness and your own essential perspective on the world? What can do that? Nothing can do it except the white, hot righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can touch it. That's the only thing that can touch it. And this is the thing. This is the, uh, the situation we're in, and this is the peril that I think that we're in. Uh, non-believers for many centuries have been able to be ashamed of their vices. We are living in a time of high rebellion where they have pride parades to celebrate their vices. So we've got pride parades to celebrate their vices. And many traditional conservative types want to react against it. There's a pushback. But in this pushback, they're dirty and we're clean. And do you see the peril? They're dirty, they're unrighteous, and they're proud of their unrighteousness, and we are going to go about to establish a righteousness of our own. In other words, we're going to go to church and have our very own pride parade. We're going to, have, we're going to do pride our way. We're going to have pride parades this way. We don't have the rainbow pride parade. We have a different colored pride parade. But, the only, but at the same time, we have to confront the moral disorder that they're introducing, yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah, God visited his displeasure from heaven against them. The moral disorder has to be confronted. But it has to be confronted by Christians who understand the gospel in such a way that they establish the moral uh, chasm between that kind of life and the kind of life that Christ calls us to, and to do it without becoming conceited. And there is no way to be righteous without being conceited unless it's the righteousness of somebody else. If it's the righteousness of somebody else, if you are submitting to the righteousness of God, then you can be moral and not be stuck up. You can be moral without becoming full of yourself because you know that by nature we are objects of wrath just as the others. There's nothing that distinguishes us from them except the grace of God. This is the hardest thing in the world for us to lose, our own righteousness. Our own righteousness is our precious, and we have to let it go. We have to, we have to throw it away, and we have to submit to the righteousness of somebody else. Our Father and our gracious God, we thank you that you have given us a gospel that touches the real problem. I pray that you would be speaking to people who are in the grip of this particular sin. I pray you'd wash away all self-righteousness. I pray you'd confront us all. I pray, that, I, I pray that you'd deal with the remnants of it in those who have already understood this truth and deal with the root of the matter in those who have not. I pray that we'd all be privileged to rejoice in the righteousness of someone else. Father, I pray that as we lift these things up, you would receive the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, we often call this meal the Lord's table and for good reason. That is the language Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. But we can become so familiar with this title, the Lord's table, that the truths signified by those words escape us. To highlight one of those truths, I'll put it this way. This is the Lord's table, not yours, not mine, not ours. It is the Lord who instituted this table, not us. It is the Lord's body represented by the bread, not yours. It is the Lord's blood 
represented by the wine, not ours. In other words, this is not a secular space or a common area. We have gathered around holiness, a table of transcendence, a place that is entirely other. Some have spoken of the righteousness of Christ as an alien righteousness to emphasize just how other Christ's righteousness is. A similar point pertains to this table. Here is a table that is so foreign, it is rightly called unearthly. Indeed, this is a table that cannot even be approached. If the Lord dwells in unapproachable light, then certainly his table is there with him in that unapproachable light. You are right to ask, if this table is unapproachable, how have I come to approach it? The answer is that you have come to approach this table in Christ, for there is no other way to approach it. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you are out there without Christ, and you are soon to come to him, eat, drink, and then depart from him. No, the life you live, you live in Christ, where you have a righteousness that is not your own, and you feast at a table that is not your own. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. We are grateful that you have given us life, forgiveness, and salvation. And we thank you that all of these gifts are found in your son, Jesus. Bless us as we come to eat and drink, for we do so in Jesus' name. And amen. The charge is this. There are three basic moral frameworks for looking at the world. Three L's. Think of them this way. There's, there's licentiousness, there's legalism, and there's liberty. Licentiousness, legalism, and liberty. And we arrange them in a false way. We tend to say, well, there's licentiousness on one end of the spectrum, and legalism is an excess of righteousness on the other end of the spectrum. But legalism doesn't have excess of righteousness at all. Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're not going to see the kingdom. So it actually goes this way. It's, it's licentiousness, legalism. Both of them are, are unrighteous because if you're proud of not having any vices, that's a vice. All right? So if you're, you're on the vice end of the spectrum. And then liberty is, where you, is the far end of the spectrum. It's the only alternative. Liberty is where the righteousness of another is given to you. Free grace, a free gift for free men and women, free boys and girls. And so... With believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.